Hello, everybody. I would like to uh, welcome you to my conversation with Rachel Fulton Brown. We had a conversation, I think, was it about a year and a half ago now, I think? And I would say that she is probably one of the people that I've been asked the most to have back on the channel, especially considering some of the discussions that I've been trying to have about feminine symbolism and its place in Christianity. And we talked, we touched a little bit about that last time in our talk, and I'm hoping that we can dive into it a lot more in this discussion today. This is Jonathan Peugeot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be back. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been, first of all, maybe in just a few minutes, you've been quite busy in the past since about a year and a half. You've also had this flurry around you. I, I get the feeling, oh, I hope that it's kind of calmed down. Maybe you can tell us where you're standing right now terms of your position and the controversy that's been kind of swimming around you. Oh, do we have to talk about that? Let's talk about symbolism. I am happy to <laughs> don't talk about that either. I, I was like, I wanted to give you let's, space. Okay, I will just, I will say, Milo, there you go. Okay, let's talk about symbolism. All right, okay, so let's talk about symbolism. That's my preference, that's my favorite <laughs> subject anyways. And so, as, as all of you know, we've been, I've been, for the past, I would say six, maybe three, four months, I've been making an effort to give uh, some framework and talk about feminine symbolism. I've, I put out a video talking about the, the place of uh, the mother of God in art, kind of the development of her imagery. I've also put out some videos talking about popular culture and how we have these strange tensions in the representation of feminine symbolism. And so I know that, you know, Rachel has written this book just recently about, about the place of Mary in medieval worship. And so I thought she would be a great partner to talk about this. So maybe, maybe you can tell me a little bit about, I mean, I know you watch my video. So, so and, and you said you're eager to talk. So let's, let's see what you have to say to start out with. Well, my first thing is you're very, you're, you're completely right about the symbolism of Mary. <laughs> um, that I, I, and, and what I'm encouraged by is that what, have you read my book? Because it sounds like have, you have. I have not read your book. I, well, that's I, I've even read better. Some articles you've written, but I have not read your book. Well, but that that's even better because you're talking about Mary as the place where God becomes present, and that's exactly what I'm showing in my Mary in the Art of Prayer. That in the Western tradition, I know you're usually working with the icons in the in the Eastern tradition, but that's what's wonderful about it. That in the Western tradition, which is drawing on the Eastern imagery, that is her primary characteristic, right? She is. Um, I think you talked about it in your in your lecture. She's the temple, um, and she's also all of the other um, places in which God manifests His presence. Um, you you mentioned I think the ark. Um, she's the burning bush. She's the cloud um, that that leads the um, Israelites as they're moving through the desert. Um, she's the the um, all the different furniture of the temple, right? She she can be the the holy of holies most intimately because that's the place where the ark is kept, and therefore that's where God becomes present in her. She's also um, in in the in, in this this interpretive tradition, the the city of Jerusalem itself. So often say the the image of the heavenly bride in Revelation is read as her. That this is this is the relationship between her and. And Christ. Um, she's the tree of life that's standing beside the throne because as the mother she stands beside the throne um, that her son sits on. She's the throne that her son sits on. Um, she's the holy mountain and, and expands out. Um, in, yeah. my, in my book I go through, I mean a lot of it is a very long list, right? If you're going to describe what it means to think about the incarnation, to say God entered into his creation through Mary, in effect, you end up having to describe the whole of creation because you're trying to describe the way in which she um, contained in her womb he, the, the one whom the heavens themselves could not contain. And so ultimately what she is is heaven. And I, I think you, in your lecture, you did a, a lovely job of showing that, that in the, icon, in the Orthodox iconography, she's always shown framing Christ, that she is the one who frames and presents her son to the world. She is the one who shows him um, to the world because he becomes incarnate through her, but that this mystery becomes cosmic because he is the creator of the world into which 
he enters through her. So I, maybe you don't need to read my book. It's already there. <laughs> well, I really do take, I mean, I really do uh, take what I know of the mother of God from the iconographic tradition, plus also the, the hymnography and the services in the Orthodox church, the way that we speak about her um, in that tradition. So I think that, like you said, I think that in terms of the symbolism, I'm sure there's perfect alignment because especially, you know, I'd say in the first 1,000 years or maybe the first 1,200 years, you, you, you know, you really had the same, a very similar mindset in terms of how to read scripture and how to see the incarnation. Um, so so when, could I say, could I say yeah, something on that? Yeah. Yes. So as the historian, right, to say, it's, it's not just that it's the same tradition, it's people are reading each other, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's the, 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 the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox sources are the direct, the direct source of the Western um, devotion. And that, that's something that it, we, we, we sometimes talk about the Catholic Church, which doesn't technically exist until the 16th century. It's, it's just Christendom, right? Mm -hmm. but the Latin Church, um, we talk about the Latin Church and the Greek Church as if they're never talking to each other. And, and the reality is, I mean, it's very interesting, particularly in the descriptions of, of the Mother of God, it's, it's, it's the same tradition. It's not two different traditions that happen to be parallel. It's the yeah. same tradition. So um, particularly that that um, in my book, I talk um, in, in chapter three about the way in which the West picks up the, the Greek imagery, that much of the Greek imagery, which if you're saying you're getting it from the iconography, from the liturgy, the, the most important sources are, are, are of course, the, 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 the hymns and, and things that are sung about her. So the Akathistos hymn, the Akathistos is translated into Latin in the ninth century. So it's okay. completely available to the West, right? All of that wonderful cascade of titles that's in the Akathisos is known in the West. Um, likewise, the homilies, the, the great eighth century homilies that are written for the Marian feasts by Andrew of Crete and Germanus of Constantinople and John of Damascus, um, those, are, those are known in the West, they're translated in the West. Andrew of Crete is, is certainly known in Rome because in the seventh, the seventh and eighth centuries, it, at the very time when the liturgies are being developed for the, the Marian um, feasts, many of the popes are from the east right they're syrian right, and yeah, greek yeah. and they bring with them this this marian tradition we know that from um 687 in in rome that all of the the, the feasts of the virgin are commemorated with the great procession and we, we could talk about the procession and, and the way the imagery is used there but they're that they're known in the west adopted in the west directly from the orthodox tradition so it's it's not a coincidence or just a, a, a you know sort of simple parallel it's mm -hmm. the same tradition Okay, that's very interesting to me because I like I did not know at all the historical manner in which this developed. I just look at the images, I look at the the art, and I look at the the you know I listen to the hymnography and I say, okay, yeah, this is the same. You right. Know, these are the same images. So I think that that link too, the fact that like you said, I mean, I knew in theory that a lot of the popes, the early popes, actually came from the east, but I, that didn't hit me that then, yeah, obviously they would bring with them this whole. Uh, the liturgical tradition, but uh, plus also, like you said, the writings, the homilies, all this development of the imagery of uh, of the Mother of God. So that, that's that's that very fascinating to me. That's for certain. So even even the things like you in in the West, there are there are different devotional traditions, and it would be interesting to talk about those if if you want to. But in the West, the, what the book my book is about is the Hours of the Virgin, which is a particularly Western. Yeah. Um, tradition, that it's modeled on the divine office that the, the monks and nuns would say, but it's basically a, a cycle of psalms that are recited um, in addition to the regular office, but a cycle of psalms that are, are recited in honor of Mary. Um, but the framing imagery is, is quite powerful there, and that's what I try to show in my book, that the, that the chants that are describing Mary in the Marian office, like, blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, uh, musically frame the chanting of the psalms. So that that antiphone, blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, frames uh, the recitation of Psalm 8, which is a description of creation, right? So it's, 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 it's sort of musically and, and oral, uh, verbally in, 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 in words, reproducing the imagery that you're talking about, right? She's shown as framing him in the, in the iconography. In the chant, the 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 chant that describes her frames the chant that describes God and and that's replicated throughout the office um, th that is a practice that's particular to the West but the choice of the Psalms 
depends on the imagery that's used in the liturgy in the East. And that's what I show that the Psalms that they choose in the West to say in this Marian office are the ones that the Eastern homilists draw on the most to, to describe her. So it's, it's, it's a wonderfully um, uh, married tradition. Yeah. One of the things that, that I try to help people understand, especially people who are coming from the Protestant uh, tradition who really struggle with the imagery of, of the mother of God. And I totally understand it. I mean, I think that as a Protestant myself, that was the first, you know, the emotional kind of reaction when you see some of the things, but as you start to analyze the hymns and you start to analyze even the longer prayers or the, or the services, which kind of are more, have a, have a more Marian, um, theme, you see this movement, the movement that you just mentioned in the antiphon, which is blessed art thou amongst women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. And so mm -hmm. it's always this, you always have this movement from the outside towards the inside. You have the movement from the space to, let's say, the, the, the definer of the space from, so you always kind of move from, uh, from, let's say, the space of the revelation to the revelation itself. Uh, and I, I mean, that's something that I've seen as a, as a structure. And so it is, it is kind of this like elevation of, of the space of the space of manifestation, because it's full of glory that, you know, it is, it is in a way, the way that by which we're able to see what, you know, the divine manifesting itself. And then there's this like rise up towards praising God himself, praising Christ and praising, praising through Christ, praising God. So it's always this movement to moving, moving up. It never stays at this, because people are afraid that somehow we're treating the mother of God as if she, as if she's God herself. Um, exactly. I, I've been having lots of long conversations in my Facebook um, on that <laughs> um, because people have come and friended me for lots of different reasons. And, and some of them are because of Milo um, and others because they're Catholics. And it's very interesting to me to see the tensions there that, that, that there's this a fear. I mean, the Protestants are really often quite afraid that we are worshiping Mary, and and it doesn't matter. It, it seems curious that the you know the Catholics. I don't have. I need some more Orthodox friends. Um, that the Catholics are saying no, we don't. She is the one who you know helps us see God, right? And in the in the tradition I'm writing about in the in the Middle Ages, it's it's not just physically that she helps us see God. I mean, incarnationally, right? That's the whole iconic the whole iconographic tradition that you work in depends on that understanding that as John is Damascus is saying, you know, like you can, the, the, the image points to the prototype. You can only make images of, of Christ because of the incarnation, right? Otherwise you don't have, you can't represent the divine mm -hmm. um, visually because there's no visualization. Um, but the same thing in the, in the Latin tradition is that she is also holding God in her mind, right? She's the model contemplative. Um, because, I mean, as she holds things in her heart, as she understands Christ, as she, she lives with him in his earthly life, um, you talk in your lecture about how she's at the marriage of Cana, sort of nudging him, and I'd like to talk about that, nudging him to, to, to you know, perform his first sign, that she is the one who, 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 who directs the contemplation to God as well. So all of it is all, it's both in the incarnation and in the understanding of his divinity that she's a creature who points us to the creator that's that's her primary her primary mystery yeah and and there is i think that also in the movement this is something that i that i've been thinking about a lot in the movement of the hymns around the mother of god and the manner in which we speak of her and the manner in which we we celebrate her you can see the proper movement from creation to the creator because mm -hmm. one of the problems that you get that i i remember even experiencing that in in a um, in the Protestant church where they say you only we only worship God we only worship God we don't we don't worship anything in creation but because they because they have this strange uh, they, they don't they're not able to see how you move that way then you have strange moments like in church when somebody let's say somebody does a uh, sings a song and then people clap it's like right okay so what are you what are you clapping to are you clapping to the person who who sang? Because if you're doing that, then you are you're you're worshiping your that person. But <laughs> you don't have the proper theology to understand how you can move up, like how you can kind of right. gather that celebration of what you saw up towards the Creator. How you can both celebrate the vehicle, uh, the vehicle uh, of manifestation, 
and and move towards the towards the creator himself but in that i think that the, the movement that we experience through encountering the mother of god and and moving towards the the incarnation that's the proper movement and can help us understand how we can interact with creation and the creator you know all all in this celebratory manner yes <laughs> Anyway, that's just is something that I've been thinking about so much because I, uh, I, I mean, even when, I remember even I was when I was Protestant, I had that, I kind of had that that problem where it's and I even remember in some churches they would say things like, oh, we shouldn't clap, because they knew the problem, they understood the problem of celebrating, congr you know, celebrating something that's happening, but then not knowing how that moves up towards, not understanding right. this kind of hierarchy of of how it moves up towards the 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 creator. Um, so there's there, so there's another way I, I've tried to argue for Protestants since it's both you and I are converts, right? That I I was a Presbyterian until recently when I entered the the Catholic Church. But I've obviously been I've been studying Mary now for thirty years, right? And what I'm interested by is I studied Mary as a Protestant in effect because what I have been working on is the the exegesis, right? The scriptural interpretation and the liturgy and the ways in which in medieval Christianity, the scriptures were understood to speak about Mary. So I really started from a very Presbyterian place. It's like I need to understand what the scriptures say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we talked about some of this and maybe in our first video, um, possibly, but just to rem to to reiterate um, that my first my first book is on the, the commentary on on the Song of Songs and the ways in which the Song of Songs is used in the Marian liturgy as a way of describing her relationship with Christ, her relationship with her son as in the mystery bride and bridegroom because she's the bride of God, um, but also very intimately in their in their earthly life um, because there's this, I'm not sure we wanna go into this, but the, 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 in um, medieval and orthodox um, exegesis, you understand that the scriptures speak on a number of different levels, right? And so there's the, the story level, the history, there's the moral level, the, the tropological level, the lessons that we get um, as souls from the scriptures. Um, and then there's the allegorical level, which is the mystery of, of Christ and his relationship with his church. And the Song of Songs is read, I mean, it's like God and Israel. So that's the allegorical level. It's Christ and the church. But there's also this, this interesting problem of, well, who is Solomon in describing his relationship with his love? And if you read um, the Old Testament, as, as Christians do, as always patterning itself yeah. on Christ, the Song of Songs is also patterning his relationship with, with Mary, who is his, his, um, his mother, his bride, his sister, his love, his friend. I mean, all of those relationships come into it. And, and so it gives the, the medieval Christians a way of imagining um, their conversation, as it were. Um, in, this, in the new book, and I'm, we, I'm certain that's just set off alarm bells for everybody. So, <laughs> whereas in the new book, I'm showing, as I said, the way in which the Psalms are understood to, to, to reveal this kind of relationship. And that matters <clears throat> because, of course, the only, reason, the only reason Christianity is Christianity is because we recognize Christ, uh, Jesus as the Lord. And, and therefore, in the, in, in the Christian tradition, we read the Psalms as speaking about Christ. So, for example, on, on Good Friday... Um, we, we, we chant um, Psalm 21 in the Septuagint numbering, right? You just use the Septuagint numbering. I can just stick with that, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's fine with me. Good. <laughs> As, in fact, Christ's words from the cross, because they were what Jesus said, you know, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken yeah. me? Which is the psalmist's exclamation. So we take that as the speaking of Christ, that this, this whole exegetical tradition is the only way we have access to to, to the fully full understanding of Christ as Lord, but it's similar that it's the way we have access to Mary in his, in her relationship with him. Yeah. And if you're nervous about that, well, Calvin does it too. <laughs> so it, it's interesting that I think a lot of modern Christians don't actually understand the, the, the exegetical tradition on which even Protestantism mm -hmm. depends. No, I agree. I, and I think that recovering the, this, this tradition, is is so primordial to me i mean that's that's what i've been i've been like trying to do so much is trying to help people see the manner in which the christ becomes the fulcrum and then we look at these patterns in the old testament as always manifesting let's say uh the mystery of the incarnation 
And so it, it, to me, it, it makes so much sense that <clears throat> in the Old Testament, you do have this, this place for the, 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 the let's say, the, the manner in which you, you contain, or not contain, but let's say the temple, the, the ark, all these vehicles of manifestation, and, and they're very important in the story. And so the question is, once God becomes, enters into the personal story, once God is incarnate, then that pattern must continue. The pattern must find its resolution, you could say. And so then what is the resolution to, to that pattern? In the story of Christ, it's obvious that the resolution is Mary because she, she is the one who, who had him in his womb. But also there are these mysterious verses where it talks about her, you know, gathering all these things in her heart, like this, the, uh, mm -hmm. gathering all, all, the, all the things she sees in her heart. And, and that is just also this image of this, this space which gathers in and kind of shows you the, the, uh, the, the spark, the divine spark, let's say. Um, and then, uh, then it also becomes the the church it also becomes the believer just the believer the <clears throat> the human person ourself that that in a certain way we, you kind of vacillate between saying that the mother of god is our hope because she is the one who who had the living christ inside her which mm -hmm. is what we want but we're also aiming towards christ himself which is you know which is the image of god himself and so you kind of have this this vacillation between um and, and it's interesting because I, I always see in, in the imagery of the mother of God, it's interesting that, for example, some images, they will be used the same images for Christ as for the mother of God. Uh, and you can understand it because you can understand that each, each image has a kind of substance, like a, a substance part, which is underneath. And let's say a, let's say a, 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 or a feminine part and a masculine part. So the latter, for example, like Christ will be, described as a ladder as well and and the mother of god will be described as that ladder but there is the ladder which is the let's say the 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 support for the movement and then there's the actual ascent and descent which is also the ladder i don't know if i don't know if you 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 see what i'm going here i do because it she's the mirror um and and that's the 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 other element of the scriptural tradition is to appreciate that the marian tradition depends on the septuagint um and that's why the, I mean, the Orthodox tradition, and it, it particularly depends on the books of wisdom, um, wisdom and Ecclesiasticus. And those are, the, those are the texts that are used in addition to the Song of Songs and the Psalms to describe Mary. And one of the most important um, passages describing her is that she's, this is from Wisdom 7, she's the mirror of his majesty, mm -hmm. right? So Mary is the most, she's, all of us as, as human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, but the, the great mystery is, of course, she is the most perfect creature ever made because she was the one who contained him in her womb. He makes her to be his mother, um, which means she is the most perfect reflection of God. So all of the, the, all of, this is why it's like she becomes most like God. That's what Dante describes her, that she has the face that is most like Christ's. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in the Western art, you know, it's like the, the, the greater similarity you can show between the two of them. There's a, she's his mother, so his flesh is her, her flesh is his flesh, mm -hmm. as it were. He gets his flesh from her as a creature, but she is made so perfectly in his image. She reflects him most perfectly. It makes utter sense that all of that imagery to, and, and you you end up with this the mirroring constantly right it's like you see her you see him in her you see you he you look at him you understand why she so resembles him yeah and and in that i think that one of the i would say one of the the side effects of of modernism one of the side effects of the modern age has been a a kind of objectification of creation or or mm. a lack of capacity to see in creation, this this mysterious uh, space for the divine to manifest itself, um, and I wonder if you've thought a little bit about the relationship, let's say, with um, the changes in the way we we understand, or that the West has understood Mary, especially in kind of Germanic countries and and uh, and, and Protestant countries, and that shift towards a almost mecha mechanistic vision. Oh of yes, Christ. yes. I think I think that that's w losing Mary means we we lose the the vision of reality that I think you have been trying to describe in your lectures, that she meditating on her means you're meditating on creation and you're, and you're meditating on the, the sort of 
um, well, one, you're, you're suggesting the proper relationship between our, you know, ourselves and God, God and creation, but you're also understanding the, the, the creature, right? And that's, I was talking about the different titles that Mary has in the Middle Ages, that she is, if she's heaven, she's the stars, the sun, the moon, the dawn, you've talked about the dawn a bit, um, that she's the earth, she's the mountain, she's the rivers, that's some uh, trees, lots of trees, those are all from Ecclesiasticus, flowers, you're realizing that you're you're looking for the signs of the divine in his artwork mm -hmm. and and that she points you to that as well because you're meditating on her through all of this symbolism right if you're the rose the lily the cedar of lebanon the 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 um the palm tree um the the spices all of those things you're you're in effect understanding that creation is this great work of art and mm -hmm. it, it, it and and we seem to you know the the problem is you know, how do you contain God in your, in your understanding? How does she contain God in herself that ultimately becomes encyclopedic, right? But it becomes encyclopedic in this understanding that you need to understand the properties of all the creatures in order to properly praise her, because in praising her, you're praising the creator. Yeah. And, and that, again, it's that, ref, it's that, that, wonderful, that wonderful reflection that, that she reflects the creation. She reflects the beauty of, I mean, it's not even nature, right? Nature seems separate and distant and we're not a part of it. She's, she's the image of what it means to be human in creation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know a little bit about the controversy, the, the Orthodox controversy surrounding uh, the, the, what's called sophiology. Have you, do you know a little bit about that story? Yeah. Well, not maybe directly, but I've, I've been tangled up in it in criticism of my book. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's important to, I think it's, maybe we can talk a little bit about that because there is, there was this move in the 20th century, in the 20th century. And I think you can feel it also in, in Catholicism a little bit. There's this move also in, in Orthodoxy to kind of push things further in terms of the, the place that the mother of God has. Uh, in the Orthodox church, there was a, a theologian, Volgakov, who, who, who tried to link, let's say the wisdom of God, uh, so closely to to Mary that to make her almost like an incarnation of of Sophia, um, and and it, in the tradition in the the patristic tradition there is a kind of there's a shift because in the patristic patristic tradition often Sophia or wisdom of God is Christ like that he's that it's seen that is Christ who is the wisdom of God but then in the the text the wisdom is often described as feminine and so there is. I think that the the I think that the the best resolution of that was is that image of the mother of God with Christ on her on her lap, which is that is the best image of Sophia in the sense that it is you know it is the 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 the, the wisdom of God sitting on his throne, but it's all one image like it all kind of goes together because he gets his body from her, and so there's this kind of coming together. Um, but maybe you can tell me a little bit about how you got pulled into the, the this criticism. Well, because that's the way she's described in the West, in the in the medieval tradition, that she is sapientia, but she's also mater sapientiae, right? She is she's wisdom and the mother of wisdom. And it, it it one of the texts that I talk about in depth in my book is Richard of Saint Laurent's book on the praises of the mother of of of, of Mary, de laudibus, well, whatever. Um, and um, in his preface, he talks explicitly about this mystery, right? That because she's the most perfect reflection of him, because she's filled with him, she, it, you know, carries all wisdom. And so that 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 twinning is again. It I, we've been talking about it already. That she is always creature, right? That is that is very very clear in all of the Latin all of the Latin texts. She is his most perfect creature. But because she's so perfectly mirroring him, she becomes godlike. And you you've talked about that too in your lectures that in the orthodox tradition we are you know theosis is a is a, is a thing right well yeah. she is most transformed into the perfect reflection of of the divine and that includes as wisdom so in the in the medieval tradition particularly in the 13th century she's the patron of the university of paris um the faculty of arts because they understand that because she contained wisdom she contains wisdom, right? So she contains all the language arts. She contains the quadrivium, the, the mathematical arts. She knows the, you know, all the mysteries of theology. She knows the mysteries of the angels. 
which is to say, if you were filled with God, this is what you'd know. <laughs> um, and it, it, it's, it's, it's complicated because back in the, in the early tradition developing her liturgies, um, drawing on the text where wisdom speaks, for example, Proverbs, well, is that Christ or is that his mother? Well, it's, it's, you, have to, you have to play the sort of face vase game. You know, the, there's that, that um, it's, it's a, a, what do you call, optical illusion, right? That you have, is it two faces or is it a vase, mm -hmm. right? And, and thinking about Marian imagery is often like that. It's always, you know, the faces show you the vase, the vase shows you the faces. She is wisdom, she shows you wisdom. He is wisdom, she contains him. And um, so it's actually a meaningless question, it, ultimately. Right. It's like, which one's which, right? Yeah. Like, and I think that as we understand, I mean, it all points to the mystery of the incarnation itself, exactly. which is that I, one of the reasons I think that wisdom is portrayed also as feminine in the Old Testament is because of this idea of wisdom as this, as the, you know, the, the, the presence of God in the world, like, like, like you were saying, this kind of, this kind of, so it is, it, it can be, first of all, even in the Old Testament, it kind of makes sense to have this, this kind of underlying wisdom, which is kind of under the world. It makes sense to represent it as, as feminine. And then as we are the body of Christ, also we, we are the bride of Christ. We have all this whole, there's this whole eschatological aspect to it, which I keep telling people that uh, the problem with, I think the problem with sociology was that it was uttering something which is eschatological and was trying to utter it as if, in a manner which was not just leaving the mystery of the eschatology to what extent we will participate in God, like to what extent we mm -hmm. are called to be deified. Um, the, you know, the, the church fathers always kind of leave it up and say, you know, St. Maximus the Confessor always says, to the extent that that's possible. That's always the, the phrase he uses, kind of leaving it up to, to like, I don't know exactly how far, how far it goes. Uh, right. Like you said, uh, maintaining the creature, uh, uncreated creature distinction, but that this, this kind of full participation of the of of creation itself in the life of God shining forth fully, being fully uh, united with with its creator in a way that we can't fully contain. Uh, and I think that that mystery of how the mother of God there's this 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 vacillation between the imagery of wisdom between Christ himself and his mother is pointing to me to that eschatological possibility. And that's kind of how I see it. That's kind of how I resolve it in, in, my, in my mind, at least. I, I like that. And, but, and the thing is, I think what I, the, the other thing, uh, going back to something we were suggesting earlier, this mystery is that you, you came to all of this by making the art, right? This is a very, this is a very visual mystery always. And, mm -hmm. and that's, I, I find that, I mean, this is where Protestants, I think, you know, struggle, right? It's like, you can't do this just with words that much of it is only accessible to us in the, the visual representations, the kinds of things, the kinds of images that you work with and that you make, because it's, um, once you show it, it's like the, the throne of wisdom images, right? It, it captures that entire mystery and then you mm -hmm. have to meditate on it and, and talk about it and, and, and encapsulate it. But there's, there's something in the, 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 the visual representation that it does go beyond what we're able to talk about. Yeah. Um, there Although, as I said, in the, in the liturgy, it's, it's also represented in the, in the chant, right? So the framing can, can, the framing can take place in, in words, in, in sound, but it, it's, you need both the visual and the oral, I think, to capture the fullness of how hard it is to think, what does it mean that he entered into his work? Right? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think that that's really the thing. And there are some things which... It's so funny because there are some things which, which you, you, if you say, they become untrue as soon as you say them. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know the the and I and I really think you know the um, I, I think about for example the 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 idea that we're called to be united with God to participate in God to be full of of uh, of God to the extent that that we can attain that. But if you say, as soon as you say, I am deified or I am. <laughs> as soon as you say that, it becomes untrue because then right. it's not. It, it, then it becomes a, a, a grabbing onto your own prideful thing. And so mm -hmm. the difference between, and the difference is really the difference between Eve reaching up and grabbing the fruit for herself, 
and the mother of God who in her, in her humility and in her, her kind of willingness to just say yes and to just say yes to, to this, this, this amazing thing that was happening to her and to almost be and to even be effaced in the story, in the gospel story, she's quite effaced. There are a few mystery, mysterious, um, I think there, there are a few really key verses that, that are, if you read them, if you kind of pierce into them, you actually see that there's something else going on, but that, that's the difference. And that's why, and I think that that's why, that's the difference between Eve and Mary, is that in a way, <laughs> in a way, the, the fruit was given to, to Mary. The fruit that, that Eve uh, wanted to take from the tree was given to, to the mother of God in her humility. The mm. fruit of, of, of knowledge and the fruit of life was given to her. And that's, that's what the incarnation is. It's like she is this flip side of what happened to at, in the beginning. She kind of resolves, she resolves in the incarnation the whole question of how we can participate in God, how we can be given to be united with God. And what does that mean? What does that look like? We should talk about the feminine imagery. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> so I'm very, I'm very interested in, in the, the video you did on with symbolism and propaganda, the, you were reading the inversions of the feminine care, the, that, that pattern of inversions that's showing up in the superhero movies yeah. where the women are, you know, the, you put women in the role of the masculine heroes. Yeah. Right. Yes. And it's a huge problem. <laughs> um, and I liked, I liked the way you showed it's like, we need to watch for these patterns because that's when we start seeing where the symbolism is most active and um, I guess you, I'm, do you, are we assuming your viewers have seen that video or do we want to talk it through? I would say you? probably of all the videos that I've ever wa ever made, probably we can assume that that video has been watched by whoever's watching this. I think I right, have like, so, it's so we're talking Ghostbusters and, we're yeah. <laughs> and some movies that I haven't seen and Star yeah. Wars and things like that. And um, I, I, the Wonder Woman is the one exception, but I think what your analysis was actually very astute there, where she has to take out the church. That I hadn't thought of that one. Um, but this 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 curious need to take a masculine role and simply stick a woman in it, and then say, "Look, we've you know empowered women." I think that's nonsense. I think it's ridiculous. And the more I start seeing it, uh, the, the more. Um, well, I, I, I find, I mean, disgust is an interesting response, right? I'm finding, I, I find the humiliation of the men for the elevation of these women into the masculine roles profoundly disturbing, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, really awful. And I think it's, 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 it's the, Milo, uh, <laughs> it's what he was trying to say about the Ghostbusters movie, right? It's like, they're, they're not female characters, they're not feminine characters, they're just women in masculine dress and what i find interesting is that's one of the things that in the past used to be a criticism of uh, there's this famous phrase in the not in the i think it's in the gospel of thomas it's one of the gnostic gospels that the, the sort of famous thing you know, like oh the gospels that the church didn't want well one of them was one of them is saying when christ says when jesus says to the apostles when they're complaining about mary being there yeah. and it's a little it's a little ambiguous whether it's mary the mother mother of jesus or whether it's mary or mary magdalene or one of the other marys yeah. and um and and jesus says to them well that's okay i'll make her man yeah I know. and then she can be saved and everybody goes ah and the thing is they're right to say ah because we don't i mean women don't need to become men yeah in order to be um you know transformed in because we're already made in the image and likeness of god that's the great mystery of christianity how is it that he's we are made male and female in the image and likeness of God. And what does that, that, you know, pairing of masculine and feminine actually mean? And I think, you know, that's, I'm starting to realize that all of the work that I did in my first book on the Song of Songs, it's the relationship between the masculine and the feminine. That's what that book is about. It's about the mystery of the relationship between the masculine and the feminine. Yeah. And what happens is, I mean, this has been my, my understanding is that what actually happens in that equation is a strange phenomena where it's actually the feminine which suffers the most in the mm -hmm. end because it, yes. it is this idea that you know in order to be important in order in order to have value then you have to have these masculine characteristics and then all the private you know the 
the private sphere, the, the, all the, the, the traditional feminine qualities are actually seen as somewhat degraded, somewhat, you know, uh, useless. Because, Utterly. They're destroyed. Yeah. yeah and, and, and then there, there is this, you know, <laughs> yeah, anyway, so, so I, I, I think that we're, there's a lot of room for, it seems like there's a lot of room right now for people who would want to tell some good stories, uh, that would have well, okay, powerful... so what I've been thinking, right, yeah, so what, one, I also, you, I now I, I can't remember who you were talking to in this video, but you talked about the, the domestic, right, the mother makes the home, um, and, and we did a, we did a video in Three Craters um, with one of our guests where he does house renovations, um, mm -hmm. Adam Paul Levine, and we talked specifically about that imagery of the, the home being associated with the mother, the grandmother. And you start realizing it's like, no wonder everybody's miserable, right? We have no homes anymore because the woman isn't in the home. And, you know, there, we have all these sort of tropes and jokes in, in our culture about, oh, you need the gay, the queer eye for, for the house renovations. Adam is gay too, but <laughs> that, was another, that was another video that we did. And it's like talking about his, his, his adventures as a conservative and a gay man. Um, that, that we recognize the necessity of making a home and yet have devalued it completely saying, oh, women should be out in the workplace and what they did in the home is, is degrading to them. And it's like, how is that possible? No, what you have done is degrade the feminine, not elevate women and you culture, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. if you don't, if you cannot value the way in which mothers, create this space for their husbands to go out into the into the workplace and be strong and, 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 and if productive for their children to be nurtured and 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 challenged and 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 cherished and given courage to go out into the world. Um, this is I mean, but, but I know you're friends with Jordan, but this is one of the things that I think he's gotten completely wrong um, that he, he create he's sort of focused on this image of woman as chaos that the man then has to order. It's like, no, 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 no. There's, there's feminine chaos and feminine order. There's masculine chaos and masculine order. And the feminine order is exactly what Mary is embodying for, for Christ, right? She is the place from which he goes out into the world. Yeah. She is the, the ordering structure. I mean, that's why she's all of those images of creation because she is literally the ordered cosmos, right? That he takes takes body in, and then if you think about that, the the, the wonderful uh, the marriage of Cana is just like my favorite story of ever. I mean, they're, all the Marian stories are wonderful. But so he's there. They're at the marriage. They're at a, a wedding, right? They're at the joining of a man and woman to make a home, so that there be children, so that there'll be you know heroes and 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 you know daughters and sons that go out into the world and daughters making their own home. And Mary is the one nudging him to say, you know, they have no wine. And I love his response to her. It's like, you know, and it's read in a lot of ways in the, in the, um, the exegesis, like, woman, it's not my time. And you could just feel the son saying that to his mother, not yet, mom. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, she needs that little nudge to go into his, his role as, as, you know, the savior and performing the signs. And there's, I think in that 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 exchange between the two of them is is like the most the most wonderful moment of of real human interaction between a mother and a son, but also the cosmic reality okay. that it's the feminine that gives the masculine the 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 space to become hero within yeah. right. And yeah. so I I I think that we have somehow managed to degrade motherhood. I mean that abortion is like oh a woman has a right to choose to murder her child. What are you thinking? That, that, that you have made women into monsters by defining their femininity on the basis of their 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 ability to kill uh, that's just it's it's mind-boggling to me no I, I i totally agree i think one of the things you said now is very important when you talked about how there is this the way also that jordan talks about you know like order and chaos and how order is masculine and, and feminine is chaos and i think that that it is obviously far more subtle than that. And, and the way that we see it, um, I think that the basic structure of heaven and earth that we find in the beginning of, of, uh, of Genesis is a, is, is a good way to do it because it is that, let's say, um, you could say order and potential. I like potential better than chaos has such a negative uh, sentiment like order and mm. potential, but then, I you think chaos is real, though. Yeah. I think I'd like to talk about that a bit, right. but go on. But the thing is that 
order actually happens in between. That's the, that's one of the diff, more difficult things mm -hmm. that I think that, that Jordan kind of gets wrong in terms of, of the, I mean, it's fine the way he does it, but I, he gets wrong. It's not that it's not that you have the city and you have the outside of the, the city, which is chaos. It's more like you have this axis in the center, which is, let's say, the, let's say like a, a connection to heaven or connection to identity, a connection to, to uh, your name, all that. And mm -hmm. then you have potentiality. And what happens in between is order. Order is the proper joining of feminine and masculine. And so I love that. that. That's yeah, and so that's better. when you yes. right. So that's when you see. Yes. So the city can have had the city is always represented as feminine because right. it is the space in which in which the ordering happens. But it's also like the 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 particular questions, the particular problems of of establishing an order. You know, the questions. It's like how do we do this? How mm -hmm. do we do that? Do we put a right. window here? Do we put a roof? How like what is it that we're going to do? And mm -hmm. then. The, the 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 let's say the name which answers those those particulars and the interaction between those two is what actually creates what we'd call ordered space uh, and I think that that's a that's a far more um, it's a far more accurate way to understand it it's also it's a it's more closer to the biblical image because heaven isn't doing anything and earth isn't doing anything it's when the name starts to come down you know when God mm -hmm. speaks down into earth and then calls forth earth to produce it's the earth that produces he you know it's not so so earth does participate in this gathering together you know to kind of answer the to 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 answer to the name of what god is saying it's like let the earth produce uh uh you know trees and it's like the earth is the one is the one that produces the trees so this it's this interaction so it really is more that there is like the that's when you can really see it differently that it's the kind of the sexual union between heaven and earth, which creates the child, which creates this, this. Yes. So that this, this is fertile, right? Yeah. This is, this is fertile ordering. And, and that's, you know, that, the, that you need the, the, the couple in the home, right? You need the masculine and the feminine in order for there to be children that it's, it's, uh, um, and this, the, 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 the mystery. And I think, I mean, Christianity, I think understands this beautifully Right, that you and you were talking about Ephesians too in one of your lectures. That you know that the the way in which um, we are bride and bridegroom with God as soul and 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 God, but the the masculine and the feminine are modeling that because it's only with that balance and and um, um, well, I would think or, ordering that we actually end up with fertility, right? And otherwise, what you're talking about with the inversion, the fem, those women in the stories that become the, the soldiers and the men who are humiliated again i cannot i cannot tell you how disgusting those images of men being made small are to me i i despise them i will not go see movies anymore because nothing happens but that some and you know i'm a fighter right yeah. i'm a fighter in a lot of ways right i've you know fought for milo you know for the last two years i'm a fencer i know what fighting is i am not a woman who thinks you know one, I do want the man to come rescue me because I do. Um, but on the other hand, that there's a, there's a there's a proper supportive role that both of them play that has nothing to do with these the, the, the characterizations that are in these these contemporary movies where the the man is a terrible father. What what is the point in 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 you know the Incredibles with him not being able to take care of the children? That's ridiculous. Fathers are are perfectly well. You know the, you need them to be nurturing and and encouraging. And you know the dads are always the ones that throw the babies up in the air and give them you know the the, the sort of taste of adventure, right? Where the moms are going, oh no, <laughs> you need both of them. Yeah. <laughs> you need the mother sitting there going, don't be you know be careful, dear. And you need the dad going, wee. And, yeah. and th those are both parenting roles. And somehow we've, we've turned it into this, you know, one or the other, that's ridiculous. You, you need both, both, both modes in order for the child to flourish and for there, for there to be daughters and sons that are empowered and strong and capable. No, I agree. I agree. And I think that that's, and I think that, that, that maybe it would be interesting. I, now that I, we've been actually talking about this and kind of this idea of this, of the, 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 the union of the two and the relation with the two, I'm thinking I probably will, I probably will maybe make a video on that directly because I mm -hmm. think that, that we've hit on something that to simply to simply talk about order and chaos as let's say an actual city or a manifestation as order and, and the outside is chaos. I think it, it misses it misses the essential part, which is that the city 
is the joining of heaven and earth. It's the joining of yes, that's why it's the kind heaven. of invisible it's order absolutely. and actual actual particulars. Um, and lovely, and and this is the the I did a course last year on cities and towns, and one of the things in the Middle Ages, and one of the things we talked about was the symbolism of city planning mm -hmm. in in the period. And because I'm also I haven't, you know, sort of what my new big new project is now that I worked on prayer for 15 years. Um, <laughs> um, I'm working on virtues and vices, um, but specifically virtues and vices in in the city, right? In this, in the, because the city is the place where human beings live, right? Yeah. You, like the, the nature is is in in um, in conversation with the city, but cities are human habitations, right? right. And for the medieval city, Mary is at the center there, like the cathedral that's Notre Dame is Our Lady in the middle, right? It's our, and, and the city forms around the cathedral. The city, literally, cathedrals are the place where the bishop is, so a city is technically the bishop's seat. But the city forms around the cathedral, and the cathedral is an image of Our Lady because in the cathedral, in the church, God becomes present, right? So it's it the, the whole architecture of medieval cities is premised on the ordering around um, this twinning of of yeah. god and cre creation god and creature Ma mary and, and and christ no i agree and i think that you know that's when you start to understand some of the imageries of like for example that uh, in constantinople when there were problems they would uh they would parade an icon of the mother of god on the wall like around right. and and the mother of god is seen as the protect protect protectress of the city there are images called the the protecting veil where you see you see the mother of God standing and she holds her veil or over the people and she's kind of covering the people with her veil. And you see the that Mephorian. same- image. It's the Mephorian, right? Yeah. Yes. And you see the same image in, in the West, but more you, you see her holding out her, her cape and you see all these people inside her cape, kind of like, you know, the, this mother hen that has all these people inside her, her cape. And so you really do see that, that image of, of the feminine as this kind of gathering in this, you know, the wall around or, or, or and that's why I always, try to help un people understand that that the relationship between masculine and feminine happens at many levels right so the like you said what you said is perfect like the center of the city has let's say the spire and you have this idea let's say of a divine ray that would come down like a like the this divine manifestation the glory of god which descends on on the 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 holy of holies uh and and that is in christianity like the the Eucharist, the altar, the, the the invisible transformation that happens in the in the, the Eucharist, um, but then it's also it also has so it has this masculine ray that descends, you could call it, but it also has this space, which is the feminine space, which you need right. for that to be seen. And then you exactly can, right. So then you can go out and you have on the wall, the wall you have an aspect of the wall which is the protective aspect, which is a holding in. Then you also have an aspect of the wall, which is the warrior standing with his with his bow and art with his bow and arrow, shooting the enemies on the outside. And right. that's that's the masculine aspect, which is you know kind of fighting, beating off the the darkness. And so each each layer has this joining of masculine and feminine, you know, at every at every uh, let's say point of the way. And when you start to see it that way, it's okay to understand it primarily as just this first opposite like heaven and earth and this kind of masculine feminine and this normal opposite but you have to understand that the world i talk about this all the time the world is a is is microcosm within microcosm within microcosm right. and so so every part has that for it to exist it needs to have a joining of heaven and earth at every level of of the manifestation of the city let's say yes and that that one of the things that i find have always found most frustrating about all modern discussion of masculine and feminine imagery is it, it refuses that ne necessary interaction. It's like um, the <clears throat> Eric Neumann's book on the Great Mother is. Uh, there's a lot of Marian imagery in there, and he makes some ma major mistakes, right? There's. I did a blog post about this. Um, in, in I have a page on my blog, Fencing Bear at Prayer, that the Lady and the Logos, and I've done a, a number of posts about this this problem of the Marian imagery that um, Neumann in his Great Mother. Um, suggests that Christianity doesn't carry this imagery and every single image that he's invoking of the mother as, you know, vessel and container and space and all, they're all Marian, right? But yeah. he just somehow didn't know it. Um, and, and that's been a sort of curious feature of, of modern discussions of 
the medieval and orthodox tradition of devotion to Mary, it's like they're blind. Yeah. Right? They have no understand. They're, and they're, they, they don't understand that the feminine is, you know, in interaction with the masculine in the way we've been talking about, and that the wisdom is interaction. You know, it's not just body. Woman is not just body. She's wisdom. She's contemplation. She's knowledge. So it's the either or problem is 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 been frustrating me for my yeah. whole career, well, and that. It, 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 it eliminates the complexity because then when you end right. up looking, you end up looking at stories and people don't understand. It's like, why do you have Artemis, who's the, who's the, 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 the goddess huntress? Like mm -hmm. is that just, a it's no, that, that you have to be able to see this pairing of masculine and feminine at all levels and in all aspects of reality, where there is an aspect of the hunt and, and you see like Artemis is also the protector of the, the, the young the protector right. of the of the of the animal young which is like that's interesting because a hunter would want to protect the young because the hunter wants to keep hunting and so and all of a sudden you see this other aspect of hunting which is you know the duck preservation society and it's right. like so the hunter isn't just the one shooting the animals he's also the one protecting the animals at the same time and so you, you see in the mystery of artemis you can see how things are always more subtle than we tend to want to, 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 to think so. And I think that is the danger. That's an, excellent, that's an excellent example because the reason there's so many deer in the United States is the hunters have made sure there are. Yeah. Right? That yeah. You, you, you care for the population because you understand them as, as, as creatures. Yeah. And, and so I think that that's, <clears throat> that's maybe sometimes it's the danger sometimes of the symbolism and, and I can take some blame for that when I try to talk in broad categories and and in broad structures to help people see the structures uh, right away. But it's important to be able to then dive into that and see how, you know, it's, it's, it's not like wine, you know, symbolism is like wine, you know, you, you, you drink wine and then all of a sudden, once you get used to it, you start to see all these subtle, these subtle tastes and these subtle things that are happening that aren't right there at the first, at the first glance. But if you're not practiced in doing it, people think you're crazy. That's right. <laughs> and that's, no, that that's that's what happened. It is to me. like drinking wine. It's, it's well, drinking but drunk. but uh, so I, I it's my role to keep mentioning Milo because he's my best example of a lot of things. Um, but that I I started writing about the ways in which he was performing a lot of this this imagery in his talks and and you know and I compared him to Jesus because you do, <laughs> um, in in the sense that I recognized him not just talking about the patterns but performing them. Right. So that there, there are ways in which he was, you know, traveling around the country in his tour bus. And so he's like, Jesus collecting followers. And there's a bunch of young guys and they're traveling around. And he's giving talks and that pisses everybody off. And then he gets, you know, his career destroyed. And oh, wait, you know, exactly what story are we in that you, you, you start you start seeing the patterns that we are living um, and, and I think one of the things you've been trying to show in your talks is we live these stories. Right. Once you are um, sort of. A, a true conversion, as Augustine tells it in his on on catechizing, is you recognize yourself in the story, right? You Christians recognize themselves in the whole history of of creation and salvation, and you should start seeing ways in which the famous passage from the Lord of the Rings, um, Frodo and Sam recognize we're in the same story, right? Mm -hmm. We're in this pattern. We are living this pattern constantly. Yeah. Which then gets us to the the other thing that I wanted to to bring up in the masculine and feminine, that that we are we are what the imitation of Christ or the imitation of Mary means is you, you start recognizing them as the pattern for human life and understanding what Mary and Jesus's interactions show us mm -hmm. about the proper relationship between um, the masculine and the feminine. And this goes back to what you were meditating on the Mary and Eve story, right? So hold on. <laughs> We're getting there. You, you mentioned, and and this is one of the one of the stories that I have liked um, Jordan's um, um, interpretation of the Beauty and the Beast story, so that the the um, mat, the feminine hero hero the feminine story for the heroine is taming the beast. Mm -hmm. That's that's good, right? That that indeed the feminine it, proper relationship of a wife to a husband is is both encouraging him and domesticating them, right? Um, yeah. George Gilder has talked about this well in Men in Marriage, and he uses that Beauty and the Beast story too, right? The, mm -hmm. the sort of princess and the barbarian, that you have the guy outside the city who is, you know, con hunting and making conquests and things. And she by, it's a very interesting sort of problem is saying the young man who asks a woman to marry him, 
is in effect surrendering to her. That's why he kneels in our, in our tradition, kneels to her. It's also a worship of, it's also Mary, right? It's a, it's a serving of Mary as lady, right? And so you kneel to the lady and say, I, I want to serve you. And she accepts him. And by making that surrender to her, he is willing to be brought into her home, right? Which you can think about. It's like a lot of guys don't like giving that up, right? They like, you know, having their own independence and their, their, yeah. you know, they can play video games or yeah. I, I think video games are actually good. We're, we don't need to, that, that's not a bad thing. Um, but it's, it's guy things, right? And, and, and there's always that trope of, you know, the band of young men, the frat boys and stuff, one of them finds a girlfriend that's hard for the band of men because he's going to be drawn into her world now mm -hmm. and domesticated and made, you know, yeah, less beast-like. That's right. Starts to shave and, you know. Starts to shave, dresses right, you know, and that's good because she is ennobling him, yeah. right? She is giving him character and purpose if they have children he gets to be a patriarch right you, you don't get to be a patriarch unless you have kids that's right <laughs> fatherhood is good yeah. it ennobles and 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 dignifies mm -hmm. men but there's another story that nobody's mentioning you know what it is well, I'm, 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 I'm waiting with bated breath i'm like what is the other story go ahead the taming of the shrew right of course yeah we are, and that is, I mean, that is what Milo has been talking about, right? Feminism is cancer because these women are shrews, yeah. right? They're shrill, they're ugly, they are, you know, refusing the, the authority of a man quite directly, but what they're doing is refusing to respect that relationship. They are, I mean, it, it's a funny, and it's a funny in the story, right, that in, in the play, um, Catherine, Kate becomes tame, but she was an awful person before that, right? There is real feminine vice, which is, is the, the kind of thing that, that, you know, Milo has been trying to point to that is real, that women can be awful to men. And I think that that is- well, Thank what God, we, because they're human beings. I mean, my goodness. Well, right, we're both, right? So there's, <laughs> and no, and that's, I mean, it is a problem when you make the feminine the source of all virtue. We're yeah, not, of we're no. also Eve, yeah. right? We're also disobedient. We're also grasping. We're also tricksy. We also lie. We also- bear false witness. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of an example. Um, <laughs> and and to, to have this this image, that's why it's both Mary and Eve, right? It's it's just like it's both Adam and Christ. That that virtue and vice are something that both men and women need to to um, have models for and work for. And it's it's wrong to put the, the the woman in the place of being the only virtue, just as it's wrong to put the man in the place of the only heroism. That's not our relationship with God. Yeah. It's 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 that we are, and the the great mystery is of course that Mary, when God says to her, you know, you're to become the mother, says yes, right? And that's that's that 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 is the quintessential moment of the man kneeling before her, right? Angel is often shown in the in the iconography of the Annunciation coming and kneeling before Mary. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a pretty interesting image. God kneels before his mother and she accepts him. And then the, the twinning is is of course in the Western iconography that she is then assumed into heaven, crowned by him and bows to him. Mm -hmm. All of these gestures of recognition and obedience are incredibly powerful and incredibly important. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. I think, though, I always tell people that we are right now this, the, with kind of the crazy, a lot of the problems that we're having now, the feminism and, and a lot of the kind of intersectional attitude, we're also paying for something that started a long time ago. I mean, we, I think we're, we're, it's the pendulum swing from the Enlightenment. It's the pendulum swing from a world where only reason has value, where only a certain type of knowledge, a certain type of action where, where uh, conquering was the only virtue. And we lost the medieval balance that you talk about mm -hmm. uh, between, between this, this kind of the relationship between a, uh, you know, a knight who is strong and who is, who, you know, who, who goes to war and is able to protect his country, but who also kneels to his lady and is also, is also ennobled by his relationship with his lady. And so that, that that balance was definitely lost and now we've got the other side whereas it's we we've been telling people the only thing that has value is this this kind of rationalistic vision of the world and so women 
are saying, well, okay, well then I want that. Like I'm gonna, mm -hmm. if that's the only thing that has value, then I'm going to take that. And sadly- Except we, for what, interestingly, they're doing it in this, well, Freudian terms, hysterical way, Yeah. right? That they're doing it with emotion completely uncontrolled. It, 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 they're not even <laughs> behaving rationally, no, exactly. no. right? It's, no, it's, for they're, sure. they're, and, and all of the stuff, I mean, I was thinking about the Kavanaugh hearing, obviously, that all of the stuff around, you know, the, this, the, what, and, and there's, a number of people have been writing about this. Um, uh, Tony Eselin has written quite passionately about it and quite perceptively about it recently in New English Review. And Christopher de Groot has been writing about it, the need for masculine authority. Um, and and, and the, the real effect of having so many women in the public sphere, well, we've become every caricature there ever was about women. It's, it's, you know, they're hysterical, they're overly emotional, they, they can't, you know, think, it's like, and, and they're, you know, when you have a supreme, you know, a, a proper, you know, structured, rational, judicial hearing for, you know, figuring out whether or not this person is, is appropriately qualified to be a Supreme Court justice, and people screaming outside the doors, banging yeah. on them, yeah. have, you, have you lost your minds, ladies? <laughs> you are behaving like every worst caricature you say was the misogynistic literature of the Middle Ages. Well, the misogynistic literature of the Middle Ages also included images of Mary, right? right? And it's like that th th that literature, what you've been doing is saying, well, every bad image of women is not real. And it's like, well, then stop behaving like them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, I'm, I'm really tempted to say, okay, Ladies. mom. Okay, mom. <laughs> I, I think that, I think that, that we, 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 we got the message and, uh, Listen, I, I, I think we, I think we had a good conversation. We've been going for a while, and I think that that last, that last message from Rachel is something. <laughs> we all need I to hope know. it goes viral. Let's <laughs> do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rachel, thank you so much for for talking to me. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I actually felt like we break, we broke some interesting ground in in kind of showing some of the the problems that, in the way that things have been, um, let's say, represented in the in the past few years. And I think that there's a lot to talk about and hopefully we'll have a chance to, uh, to do it again. And I, and I wish you, I know we didn't talk about all your, your kind of difficulties and everything, but I do wish I you- I don't want to, no, I, I want I know, to I'm just saying, I wish you the best. And I, and I pray that, that you, that you will, um, that you always remain on top of the fray and that you'll continue on as you are right now. Well, I have, I mean, when people, you're wondering about, you know, strong women and, and great battle warrior, warriorses, Mary, for goodness sake, she's la conquistadora. She's, she's, you know, the, you talked about her, you know, they, they parade her, um, parade, they process her icon on the walls of Constantinople to save the city. You don't need any other warrior, you know, warrior um, woman. You got Mary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rachel. So, so, uh, so thanks again. And, uh, so I, everybody, I will, I will see you soon. Thank you. If you enjoyed this content and our exploration of symbolism, get involved. I love to read your insights and questions in the comments section. You can also share this video on social media to your friends. And if you can, please consider supporting us financially through Patreon or PayPal. You'll find those links in the description below.